Hello, a very good morning. You're very welcome along to Ireland M right here on Virgin Media One. And before we kick off, we want to take a moment to say a very, a very special mention to Tommy. What did you write here? Tommy <laughs> Bow, who is a complete legend. Is that right? Did I get did I get that right? I don't know who wrote that. You don't know who you don't know who wrote that at all. Yes, no Tommy, well Tommy Tommy was inducted to the Rugby Hall of Fame on Friday himself and Fiona Coughlin. Fiona being the first woman to ever be inducted into there you she are was, there. Yeah. Look at you, aren't you handsome in a suit? Why can't you dress up for us every morning? Um, no, it was a special <gasps> day. There's my family, Luke's my wife brother and his fiance Jill, mum, dad and my sister Hannah. Yeah, it was a special day. Um, I, you, it's weird to get into the Hall of Fame. You kind of think you're meant to be an awful lot older. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it was a special moment. And yes, Irish Rugby, uh, Irish Rugby Players Ireland Hall of Fame. So I, did everyone, like, I mean, people have been singing Hall of Fame at you no, all no. weekend? Be like, Sin I think in the more Hall people are just kind of thinking, him? Him? How did What's he, he get into it? We well do... deserved, Tommy. It was thank you, well Al. deserved. Thank you. And thank you for slagging me off during your speech as yeah, well. I did. <laughs> well. Proper uh, order. 100%. I got a message from the team going, we think Alan knows who he is now, now that he's at the Hall of <laughs> Fame. So, so it's very interesting. Our Hall of Famer, Tommy Bow. Thank you. Yay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, yeah. coming up this morning, we're going to be chatting to the controversial founder of the Lovin' Dublin website, Niall Harbison, who is on a mission to save thousands of Thailand's street dogs. They yeah. have it. Uh, we'll also be meeting the real-life real, ex, real life ex mobster who is turned con TV consultant on the hit TV series that I cannot watch because the violence makes me want to cry. It's Gangs of London. It's so, it's so good. So good, so, so, so violent. So violent, yeah. Uh, Barbara Windsor's widower Scott Mitchell has opened up about his romance with the late EastEnders legend in a new book. Scott will be here after nine to discuss their 27 years of marriage and Barbara's battle with Alzheimer's. Now, we give you a sneak peek there a second ago. I'm sure you're all sitting there going, what's going on with Alan Hughes? Where is he? Alan! I'm in Australia! <laughs> Get him <laughs> out of here! <laughs> Get me out of here! <laughs> yes, I'm as... Like I said, it's fab, isn't it? I'm a celeb is back. Ten celebrity campmates returned to the Australian jungle last night to face a record 24 trials. And we're going to be catching up and uh, telling you all about them last night, how wow. they arrived, what trials they had to do. Very interesting opening night. And of course, boy George. Matt Hancock, is he in it? He's is not. He, the... he won't be in till by probably next weekend. Okay, because they'll the time drop he, him in. By the time right. he gets in, no one's going to have to do any more trials. <laughs> no, no, he's going to have to do <laughs> everything. The fact that Mike... seemingly there's a thing. He, do you know where they they say? Um, oh, I'm exempt from certain trials because of oh, certain right. conditions. So yeah. seemingly there's a whole list of trials he can't. Oh, go away. Wow. Yes. Ever. I'm exempt because I'm a conservative politician. <laughs> because I don't because tell I can't the truth. Stop, I can't stop shifting people in offices. Like, what? why is he exempt? Anyway, that's interesting. Looking forward to that in just a little while. Now, it's not just one person we have to mention this morning. Mm -hmm. It's someone else. Before we find out what kind of world we're waking up to, we have to say a special mention to Rob O'Hanrahan because he is... Our countdown champion this morning. Look at him there. Hi, Rob. <laughs> Good morning, folks. How are we? You kept that under the radar, didn't you? I did. I've actually known since June, and then it was pre-recorded then a couple of months ago. So, yeah, I had to keep that under my hat for quite a while. It was and difficult. It was and you difficult. won. Congratulations. Yes, just about scraped over the line in the end. <laughs> that is not supposed to be aired on television. <laughs> <laughs> right, that, was, that wasn't the public one. That's the one Rob sent to me. Breaking the sanctity of the DMs there. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, but like, are you going to tell us how far you go? Because you're going to be on again I today. I can't. I am back on. I am hopping in the Virgin Media News jet uh, after I leave here to go over to Salzburg. No, I am in again this afternoon, and that's all I can say for the moment. That's okay. all he can say for the moment. He's going to go all the way. He's going to be a champion of champions. I suppose... <laughs> I, we'll be I haven't watched Count Countdown in years, so I'm going to be watching tonight, Rob. Looking forward to seeing you. Tonight, it's on at 10 past two. You can... You can okay, today. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, take it away with the news. Thanks very much, folks. Well, on Taoiseach, Michal Martin will be travelling to Egypt today for the COP27 climate conference. Up to 40,000 people are due to attend the event, where world leaders are due to negotiate carbon emission targets and finance for worst affected countries. The COP27 UN Climate Change Summit is underway in the Egyptian Red Sea resort of Sharm El Sheikh. 120 world leaders and heads of state are due to attend. Most will be there today and tomorrow for the World Leaders Summit on Finance and to hear the latest major climate change reports. Sea levels are rising at twice the speed of the 90s, posing an existential threat for low-lying island states and threatening billions of people in coastal regions. 
glacier melt records are themselves melting away, jeopardizing water security for whole continents. US President Joe Biden is not due until later in the week. There's doubt on whether the talks in Egypt can result in any major deals to cut emissions, with China and India not sending their leaders. The event is taking place against a very tense geopolitical backdrop. Taoiseach Micheál Martin will head up the Irish delegation at the World Leaders Summit today and he'll deliver Ireland's national statement tomorrow afternoon, setting out the government's commitment to supporting vulnerable countries. Despite the challenges facing the summit, the evidence of climate change has led to a clear sense of urgency and more than 40,000 people have registered to attend. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. Final campaigning is underway in the US ahead of the midterm elections tomorrow. Polls across America will close on Tuesday, but more than 36 million people have already voted. Our news correspondent Richard Chambers is in Pennsylvania with this report. Well, we're now in the final full day of campaigning here in the midterm elections in the US. We're here in the city of Uniontown and really there is no sense of union in the air, such as the level of division in American politics at this point. That has really taken hold over the last number of years. Never before has there been such a gap between the Democrats and Republicans and their supporters across the country. Now, the polling data suggests that the Republicans are on course to recapture the House of Representatives and are in a good position to potentially take Take back the Senate too. Uh, Donald Trump was here in the state of Pennsylvania rallying for uh, his backed candidates over the course of the weekend. He was in Florida last night uh, just across the road from his resort in Mar-a-Lago backing candidates there too. But all eyes are already drifting towards 2024 at this point. Donald Trump making almost no secret of the fact that he is going to be announcing another uh, presidential run for 2024. While question marks are now starting uh, to gather, there is a sense of uh, uh, disharmony really amongst Democrats in terms of uh, Joe Biden's prospects for 2024 and whether or not he will be uh, the nominee for the Democratic Party. So uh, much to look out for over the next number of days, uh, both in terms of the election, the results and the outcome from those results. Social media giant Meta is reportedly set to conduct widespread staff layoffs this week. The story was first reported in the Wall Street Journal in the US and comes just days after Twitter cut half of its global workforce. Meta, Facebook's parent company, employs more than 87,000 people worldwide, with thousands employed in its Dublin office. An announcement on the expected job losses could come as soon as Wednesday of this week. A month on from the Creasle tragedy, the town's parish priest says that as the initial shock wears off, the reality of what happened is becoming harder to comprehend. Investigations are continuing into the explosion in early October, which saw 10 people lose their lives. Months mind masses for the victims will take place this week as locals continue to support each other. We're all doing our, our best to, 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 to heal, not to forget, not to move on, for we won't forget, we won't move on, but to cope with the sad and most tragic reality that, that, that happened on Friday the, the Gardaí are renewing their appeal for information on the whereabouts of a missing woman from Westmeath. 22-year-old Railtine O'Brien was last seen on Dublin Road, Mullingar, at approximately half four on Friday the 4th of November. She's described as being approximately five foot seven in height, of slim build, with blonde hair. When last seen, she was wearing a black jacket, black leggings and white trainers. Gardaí and Railtine's family are concerned for her welfare and are anxious to locate her. And a yellow rain warning for Galway and Kerry is in place this morning, while a separate yellow wind warning for five counties comes into effect at 11am. Cork, Kerry, Waterford, Wicklow and Wexford are set to face a spell of very strong and gusty southerly winds, with damaging gusts of up to 110 kilometres per hour possible. There is also a concern of localised flooding in Galway and Kerry. Both warnings will end at 9 o'clock tonight. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. A wet and blustery start to the week with overcast sky and widespread outbreaks of showery rain. The best of any drier spells will be over eastern Ulster and northeast Leinster. Highest temperatures of 11 to 15 degrees. This afternoon, rain will spread eastwards across the country with localised flooding possible. It will become windy and also with strong gusterly southerly winds, strongest in the south and southeast. Early tonight, then, rain will gradually clear eastwards with showers following from the west. Some heavy southerly winds will ease as the rain clears and will be moderate to fresh in strength. Lowest temperatures of 5 to 9 degrees.
For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Now, following a year, actually following the last few years of climate-related disasters and broken temperature records, world leaders are meeting in Egypt for COP27. Yeah, after the break, we're going to discuss if the annual UN summit, well, is it going to have any impact on global warming? Yeah. Uh, let us know on this 0896 111 We'd even love to hear from you on your opinion. We'll see you after this short break. UN's Climate Change Summit has opened in Egypt, that's COP27, with a warning that our planet is sending a distress signal. So joining us to discuss this is environmental geographer Dr Darren Clark and live from Brazil is renewable en engineer uh, Fergal McEntee from Extinction Rebellion. Good morning to you both, Fergal. Um, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, Darren, we hear about global warming. We hear about all these plans with this talk of we want to just keep uh, warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. It looks like we're on target to be double that. We're going round in circles. What is happening? Where can we go? Do you see it's just inevitable that it's going to get worse? Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point. You raise a really important question. Uh, we are on course for a doubling of what we committed to in only seven years ago in Paris to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and I think countries really haven't stepped up to the mark. They've talked the talk to date, but they really haven't kind of walked the walk when it comes to climate action. I think one of the things we're likely to see in the upcoming negotiations in Egypt is a ramping up of those ambitions. So we've said that 1.5 degrees is the maximum we can get to or the maximum we, we want to limit temperature increases to. Uh, and I think as you said, 2.8 degrees Celsius is what we're currently committed to if we pledge or meet all our pledges. I think the, the, the negotiations in Egypt will now see us ramp up those ambitions further. But you're absolutely right. There's, we, we seem to be, be going around largely in, in circles. And I mean, if, if I was sitting here two, three years ago, I would have hoped that we would have had some agreement and some commitments by governments mm. today, but we really aren't getting there at the scale that we need to. Darren, I think one thing is that when you sit down and you look at what needs to be done, the scale is just so massive. And for an awful lot of us, we'll be gone. We'll, we'll be dead by the time that we're in these really large scale weather events that are going to be we'll possibly planet destroying. Mm. And we keep on seeing these ads on TV and these companies going, how you can help, how you can help, do your little bit, which is all well and good. But we've got companies who are causing large scale pollution like this. The governments are doing nothing about them. They're letting them pollute. We saw fracking licenses under Liz Truss in the UK. Yeah, let's award a bunch of fracking licenses. Let's just spill as much sewage as we want into seas. There's no pressure on companies. Governments can say all they want, but they don't seem to be actually towing, making any companies, large scale polluters, toe the line. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point. Um, I, I would take it to, I suppose, if you take this back to an Irish context, I would see that at a sectoral level, we have a, a really good opportunity. Two of our, our most polluting sectors, if we if we look at it in an Irish context, uh, and I mightn't be liked for this, are, is agriculture is one and transport is the other. But we actually have an opportunity to fundamentally make lives better for people uh, and to make transport more efficient, to make agriculture more efficient, to make it more environmentally friendly, bringing people along is the real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if you take if you take agriculture as an example, and, and, and even transport, if you take agriculture as an example, we have in Ireland and at EU levels, we have incentivised farmers financially to increase their livestock numbers. And by doing that, we've harm the climate, we've harmed the environment. What we now need to do, and there's no question, there's a realisation what we now need to do is actually incentivise farmers to instigate pro-environmental policies. So that's the likes of re-wetting land, that's the likes of uh, afforestation, that's the likes of providing grants for renewables and all of these things. But but individuals and, and, and businesses really won't get the message unless there are policies in place for them to do so. I do kind of feel, though, that if we don't 
keep the livestock here. Other countries are going to do it anyway and they're going to pick up the slack. And when we're going into a cost of living crisis where we're seeing what's going on in Ukraine at the minute, it is hitting people in the pocket and it's so difficult for farmers, for, for regular people. Let's bring in Fergal on this as well. Fergal, I mean, you're over in Brazil at the minute. You're a part of Extinction Rebellion. I mean, like going into COP27, I mean, what, what realistically can we get out of this? Well, to put things in context, uh, just a couple of points you're, picking, uh, you're talking about just there. Uh, the climate negotiations that are happening, uh, it has a completely different lexicon language. And we're talking about like the conference of par parties, which is COP, and then 26 and 27 means it's the 27th time we've had these negotiations. So 27 times this, is, this, this show has been going on. And every year, climate is getting worse. Uh, we're seeing the impacts across Europe. Um, so it's a, it's a, we're, we're pretty much heading in the wrong direction. We've got three years to curb emissions, according to the latest uh, IPCC reports that are coming out, and uh, we're going in the wrong direction. There's so many issues going on with COP. We've got like the loss and damage. We've got um, uh, how we actually have a just transition. But for me, the key area to actually look at, and it was just Darren was touching on it, is the NDCs, which is the nationally determined contribution, and the NDCs is what each country has actually pledged it's going to do to reduce its own uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And you're talking about agriculture just there. Uh, Ireland, naming and shaming, like 2020, was pretty much the worst country in Europe, uh, not keeping any of the commitments. 2021, they put an action plan into place, which is great. So the NDCs is like each country having a having a plan. It's like It's like you need to lose weight. So you, you join Weight Watchers and, and everybody says, I'm going to pledge to lose this amount of weight. And on a global scale, we're talking about each country is saying, we are going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by this amount. And as, as pointed out just there by Darren, that if you add up all these contributions together, it's going to bring us to 2.8 degrees uh, extra of warming, which is pretty much a non-inhabitable planet. You know, So this is a key area. We made the pledges in, in uh, COP26, and which was great to have nearly 196 countries come together and pledge to do this. Mm -hmm. COP27, we need action. And that's what we need. We need action. We need to start implementing these plans. And this is like we're looking at like all the headlines last week about Europe, almost double the average temperature of what we've seen. Like what? Like you can go to Portugal and it's 30 degrees. Like it's Ireland is at so the Aviva, warm. We at the weekend, it was like 12, 13 degrees in the middle of November. You didn't need a coat. Like it's oh. so like this is happening. We know that stuff like this is happening. And you're in Brazil at the moment, of course. There has been mass deforestation of the Amazon, which is basically keeping the planet going by Bolsonaro. So this is a very political issue. Extinction Rebellion have been making these sort of, you know, kind of stunts, essentially. And, and we've seen that, like, with people going into museums and throwing stuff on, on paintings and not doing any damage whatsoever. Fergal, are these things really important, like, to, to make people, even if people get annoyed, to kind of go, well, we have to get your attention somehow. We have to do things like this. Well, if you, if you think about it, and not to have a go at, you know, obviously we're we're here discussing this right now, which is which is great, but this has been going on for such a long time, and the scientists have been screaming their lungs out of actually how bad the situation is, and you know the world moves on. We're we're, we're talking about like the whole breakdown of of the whole ecosystem that keeps us alive on this planet. So for the fact it's not been talked about. You know, that's why people are taken to the streets. That's why scientists are getting arrested. Teachers are getting arrested. Ordinary people are getting arrested. Because people who actually take time to actually understand the situation we're in, realizing we're actually going in the wrong direction. We still have 20 times more funding going to fossil fuels than to renewables. You know, we've got, like, as you said, uh, you just mentioned about fracking, allowing fracking licenses, allowing the UK government is allowing new oil and gas. And we're told by the UN and uh, all the scientists, we can never, ever have any more oil and gas investment in infrastructure ever. And the UK government's doing exactly that. So we're going in the wrong direction. So, you know, we need more people calling out the governments, it's, calling out businesses. It's so, it's so frustrating and so, I'm sure, for yourself to try and... You know, to, we're trying to do the right thing here. But then when you see the likes of Rishi Sunak, he pretty much had to be strong-armed to go to this COP summit. 
you know, if the politicians aren't leading from the front in this, well, where does yeah. it leave the rest of us? Yeah, I think that's a really fair point. Uh, like the idea of being strong armed to go to a conference on, on climate when the, the, the world is in, in turmoil is, is unquestionable. He should, he should have been there. But I, I think when it comes to uh, leading by example, there's a couple of issues with that. I think Ireland as well, it's not just a case of going to a conference and uh, and representing your country yeah. at this. It's what happens after the conference. Actually and, and actually, yeah, you have yeah. to do, do something and come back and actually do something. And I think it's a point Fergal touched on uh, in Ireland, we've, we've a, a national climate plan to, to reduce emissions by 51% by 2030. Uh, and that's in, in, in legislation. We're legally bound to do that. Last year, our current roadmap, uh, we've assessed for what, we, what it will take or what we will get to based on our current roadmap of all the ambitions if we said we do everything that's in our current ambitions. And it will only get us to 28% of that. So it, it's fine in saying that, yes, we do this, but actually it has to be followed up by action. And, and Rishi Sunak going or not going is, is kind of, it's, 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 an, it, it's an elephant in the room. It doesn't really make a difference in, in to, if, he's, if he's serious yeah. about doing something yeah. when he comes back. And I think the, the, that issue versus actually doing something is much more important. When, we're when not we even back. getting onto the fact that we're now, in Yemen it's been over a decade of a famine, but what's happening in Africa, Horn of Africa, mass mm -hmm. uh, famine is happening there. Millions of people are absolutely starving. And in the 80s, that would have been on the TV all the time, but it's not now. It's 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 mad what's happening. Do you care? Does this something that impacts you, that you think about what's going to happen to the planet after you're gone? 0896 111 one. Dr Darren Clark um, from U DCU, thank you so much. And Fergal McEntee from Extinction Rebellion in Brazil, thank you so much for getting up early for, you, for, for us, Fergal. We'll talk to you again very soon. It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. Its headline, HSE to contact 100,000 victims of cyber attack. More than 100,000 people who had their personal data stolen during the HSE cyber attack last year will begin being contacted by the service in the coming weeks. More tech jobs losses feared as cuts at Facebook parent Meta. Fears for more Irish tech jobs are mounting with reports that Facebook's parent company Meta is planning to embark on a major round of job cuts in the coming days. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner leads with climate toll rises as COP27 begins. The last eight years are on track to be the warmest on record, whilst the rise in sea levels has doubled in the last 30 years. Just some of the dramatic telltale signs of the impact of climate change. On to the Daily Mail. Tourist towns demand plans for refugees. The paper reports Ireland's tourist towns say they can't cope with another influx of Ukrainian refugees due to a chronic shortage of housing as all hotel beds are full. The mirror goes with the earth is burning. The past eight years will be the hottest on record, sparking the melting of the ice caps and deadly floods and heat waves. And the star leads with mob killed Willie and Anna. A Drogheda gang has been named responsible for carrying out the double murder of William Mon and Anna Marslevain, a uh, court files claim. And the sun leads with the prices fright at IKEA. IKEA's Irish shoppers are paying nearly 70% more for their many popular products than consumers in Germany. Joining us to discuss the stories making this morning's papers is Terry Prone from the Commun Communications Clinic. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Good morning to Terry. Now, we're going to start with, uh, this is, of course, the last week has just seen tech, the tech mm. sector. We're all looking at what's going on with job losses there in news this morning that Meta is looking at cutting jobs ac across its global workforce. The new phrase is tech reset. Mm. Tech reset means recession in the tech industry. Yeah. And it's going to be big and it's going to be bad. Meta have 87,000 employees worldwide. We don't know at this stage how many they're going to cut. Um, the Wall Street Journal said that it was going to be extensive. And the word is that people were told, people working for the various outlets were told, stay home, don't do any unnecessary yeah. travel. You're going so, to get that email. <laughs> so be home to receive it to convenience us. And the word is that that's happening on Wednesday. Mm. Meanwhile, Stripe, the Irish-owned yeah. uh, company, um, is also in the business of cutting its staff because, do you know what? Oh, they just overhired. Now, that's going to be... Uh, John Isle in The Independent has very interesting stuff on that this morning. And he says it's going to be an interesting proposition 
to see how many of their 300 Irish employees mm. they can cut. Because Ireland gave them 42 million on the promise that there would be a thousand Irish jobs yeah. over the next five years, which I'm not very good at sums, but I figured that's 42,000 per job uh -huh. that the state gave them. So they might be a little bit slower to cut, cut the jobs. those cut the jobs. jobs. And they are saying, for what this is worth, their PR people would be mm. helpful in this, they're saying that they're well placed to weather a downturn. Mm. Um, in their statement, uh, when it came to Stripe, they did point to uh, the fact that they've got, you know, the revenues are huge and all that kind of stuff, which would have been hard for workers to see. They, they've said that they've overhired up to a thousand people. The fact is, with all of these tech jobs, and there was a huge amount of hiring that went on, if you look at if you look at Ireland, people are going into tech, yes. even if they're not doing anything in college to do with tech, because there's big salaries for mm. starting graduate jobs, right? They're making billions. Like, it's not like they're not making lots of money, but for their shareholders... It's not enough. It's not enough. Mm. So it's let's get rid of some people so that we can keep profits high. That seems to be what's happening. It very much, they're looking at the next quarter yeah. all the time, not as the old family firms have always done, look to the long term. Yeah. But even your point about people going into tech and getting large sums of money... Yes. Not necessarily true of all of them. And um, if you look at Meta, for example, in Ireland, they have something like 6,000 people. Yeah. Interesting little phrase coming through in the reports, and it is this, of whom half are staff. Only half are staff. Yeah. They have a system, many of these companies, where if I'm the big boy, I don't want to have any trouble with staff and benefits and health insurance and all that jazz. So I'll say to you, tell you what, you hire them and then lease them to me. OK. And so you have quite a lot of people, half of the meta people in Ireland would be on that one remove contract situation mm. where A, they can be paid less, but B, they have much less security. So this is not going to be good and it's going okay. to Just, cause a rethink in yeah, Ireland. Yeah. A worrying time for so many thousands of people Absolutely. over the next couple of days, really. And Terrifying. then with Twitter as well. It's just, it has been a, a bad week for the tech industry. It really has. <laughs> uh, Mary Lou MacDonald making some... Um, well, what would you call them? Statements over the weekend, yes, about certain things. Tell us more. In her speech and in Gavin Riley's mm. radio programme, and following her bad week, because the opinion polls were unexpectedly not mm. good just going into there yeah. or there, um, she was making a strong differentiation between murder, mayhem and crime if it's just gangland yes. murder made and crime, and if it's IRA murder In made. the troubles. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that uh, Margaret Thatcher was quoted to her. Margaret Thatcher said, crime is crime. Um, and uh, Mary Lou said, well, it wasn't really if it was inspired by high ideals. Freedom. So that's going to be an interesting sell in the future for Sinn Féin. Yeah, mm. of course, this did come up because of Jonathan Dowdall formally being exactly. a, a, yeah, a councillor in there. And it is mm. definitely a line that other parties are going to take in the lead up to the general election there. Um, so that was uh, the Ordesh that was happening at the weekend. Now, our f uh, another story today, just for something a little bit, and I, as someone from Limerick, I feel this in my bones. One in four people have had their accents mocked at work. The thing is, you're not from Wicklow. If you were from Wicklow, you'd really be suffering mocking at work. We Why? Do what? Why? Oh, Wicklow accents. What? Well, certainly... I didn't realise people in Wicklow had a very <laughs> unusual accent. What's happening, yeah. people in Wicklow? What's going on? Do oh, people in Wicklow have, have an yes. unusual accent? No, I think it's beautiful. Sarah. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Wicklow? But it is... Look at Stephen going, Stephen! ...and drawlier <laughs> and just... It's different. But the thing is, we're laughing at this... It isn't always funny. No, no because, because accent anxiety is a real thing. Never mind accent anxiety. Oh, this, okay. is called, <laughs> this has caused massacres in the past. There's a famous one where, you know the word shibboleth? Yes. Although I don't suppose you use it frequently. Um, but the word shibboleth was used in ancient Rome. What does it mean? It means... Oh. Uh, 
it means... Speak truth to speak truth to power sort of a thing. So once it's in the Bible, whereby if you're asked something um, about something, if you say, can say shiblet to prove that they were a follower of God. So it's speaking truth. She nearly has it right. I don't... Oh! Yeah, no, I don't 100% have it right. I definitely no. don't. Here's the story. I know it because of the West Wing oh, episode. Lord. They're what? put in your place by Terry I know, Crowell. but she's right. It's the West Wing episode is the only reason I know what shibboleth is. But you're so clearly... Once upon a time, there was a force <laughs> A, a victorious force, right? The losers were trying to get across the river and escape. And the very simple thing that the victorious guys did was if a, a stranger appeared in front of them, they said, pronounce shibboleth. And the other guys couldn't pronounce the H sound, so they said, sibboleth, bang, they were massacred. Now, we haven't actually given you a good definition of what the word means, but that's for another no, day. No, I feel like we need we've to do moved, that. We've moved away from the Wicklow accent, though, haven't we? I, I don't know, I don't know where we've sort of gone with it. I know I'm rewatching the West Wing tonight. I'll going that back one. to your point, people have, and it's legitimate, accent anxiety because they know damn well that if they have, for example, a working class accent, it may mitigate or militate against them getting promotion. promotion. Yeah. in certain companies. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem and there are people who are, who train people out of those working class accents as if they were wicked, which yeah. they're not. Yeah, I do. Like, I remember when Michael Luna was the leader of Fine Gael and his accent, his Limerick accent was brought up all of the time. It was. It was brought up terrible. all the time. As it's a terrible that 21% actually worried, 21% of people in that survey worried that their accent would stop them getting uh, a promotion. Mm -hmm. Like, it's crazy. Hmm? Speak shibboleth. We'll be oh, grand. Yeah. 0896 triple one triple one. Your accent, is it something that you're ever slagged about at work that people kind of point out to it? We'd love to hear from you this morning. Especially, especially if, if you're, you're from, from Wicklow. Wicklow. <laughs> Terry Pro, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Uh, now, he's the controversy courting former chef who set up a digital empire only to sell up and save stray dogs in Thailand. What a story. We're going to be meeting uh, Niall Harbison later this hour. And I heard a horrible story this weekend about uh, dogs' places in Ireland that have to close down because too many dogs have been surrendered to them. It's terrible. So if you want to adopt, think about it today. Anyway, plus he was one of the most feared gangsters in the UK. He's now a motivational speaker. I mean, isn't that great? And this I is mean, Gangs of London, isn't it? This is the new show on Sky at London. Oh that is God. so brutal. It's so violent. We're going to be talking to reformed mob boss Stephen Gillen about working on the hit series Gangs of London. He's a consultant. No, that's not violent enough, lads. Get a more exactly. violent. No, I did this. And yeah, way this is what worse. I did. Yeah. Uh, it's that time of the year when celebrities <laughs> park their pride to suffer bush tucker trials in the jungle. We're going to be discussing the early front runners in I'm a Celeb. And we've got some hot cakes in the kitchen. And you know what? We're not just talking about it. Alan and Paul, I hate myself. Hi, oh. how are you? Well, when you're talking about Paul, you're talking about a bit of beefcake, are you? Oh, <laughs> oh look at you! <laughs> I've just been talked about. I'm not yet. Yeah, yeah. Carol, Carol, here, yeah. Paul isn't here. Fifteen, yeah, love. Whatever. You're done, Myrna. Yeah, yeah. Come on, beefcake. What have you got for us this morning? Well, dear, we're making hot cakes or griddle cakes. Okay, so it's kind of a throwback to the old olden times where we used to cook on kind of like the embers and stuff. So what we're doing is still keeping those traditional recipes alive, but what we're doing is we're just obviously cooking it on a hob, cooking it on a skillet. So it's kind of like a own kind of a recipe, but it's, it's kind of cooked over on a hot pan and we're going to serve that is with it, some roasted, roasted plums. Is a griddle cake an English thing? Uh, it? It's like they say that it's Welsh in origin. A like Welsh in origin. Even when I came in today and I said it to the lady on the door, I was doing griddle cakes, oh, they're lovely. She said we used to have those as kids. So it's still kind of, I suppose, listen, it's, it's an old fashioned way of cooking. Yeah. Um, so we're just kind of reinventing that. Okay, looking forward to that. That's coming cool. up a little later on. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Times. It's headline HSC to contact 100,000 victims of cyber attack. More than 100,000 people who had their personal data stolen during the HSE cyber attack last year will begin being contacted by the service in the coming weeks. More tech job losses feared in cuts at Facebook parent Meta. That's for, uh, the front page of the Irish Independent. Reports that Facebook's parent company Meta is planning to embark on a major round of job cuts in the coming days. The examiner leads with climate toll rises as COP27 begins. The last eight years are on track to be the warmest on record whilst the rise in sea levels has doubled in the last 30 years. That's just some of the dramatic telltale signs of the impact of climate change. 
On to the Daily Mail now. Tourist towns demand plan for refugees. The paper reports Ireland's tourist towns say they can't cope with another influx of Ukrainian refugees due to a chronic shortage of housing at hotel as hotel beds are full. The Mirror's front page, the earth is burning the past eight years, will be the hottest on record, sparking the melting of the ice caps and deadly floods and heat waves. The start leads with mob killed Willie and Anna. A Drogheda gang has been named responsible for carrying out the double murder of William Maughan and Anna Barslevin, a bombshell court files have claimed. And the sun leads with the prices fright at IKEA. IKEA's Irish shoppers are paying nearly 70% more for many popular products than consumers in Germany. And it's, it's still, and it's still very cheap. It's not mad though. They've increased their prices across the board, mm -hmm. I think, as well though, because of cost of, you know, because of cost but of materials. 70%. Uh, it's insane, Listen, you can charge it? anything you want in Ireland, this place. Yeah, go on, do whatever <laughs> you want. Tax, whatever. It's hard to get yeah, it over here. Oh, yeah, exactly. it's really, really hard um, to get it to Ireland. Hey, what about so the with this amount of job cuts in Meta, it, which is quite frightening. A lot of people are worried, obviously, today that if they could get that call. And there's so many people in tech in this country there's as well. There's so many people. That like, it's it's get that email landing in your inbox. Yeah. It's and a lot of them would be contractors as well. Yeah, so it would be totally. very easy to yeah. just get rid of them. Noel's just said when workers started working from home, they highlighted to employers that perhaps they were overstaffed. More than that, it, if work is to be delivered digitally and remotely with no attendance in the office, then future work requirements could be sourced globally at the cheapest cost base. Watch this space. Workers have shot themselves in the foot. Now, they well, didn't they decide to work from home. They didn't decide if the COVID made them work from home. But probably, a lot of them have said, no, I prefer to stay working from home. So, the thing so then why you employ somebody in Dublin when you could employ them somewhere well, else would be a lot well, cheaper? Well, because there's tax repercussions and that's been uh, an issue. And not, a lot of people say, who moved to Spain from Ireland when they were in COVID and said, I'll just rent over here, it's mm -hmm. cheaper, which I totally and utterly understand. There have been tax implications as a result. And of course, you are taxed where you're based. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And we were there. talking about accents earlier on as well. And there was a survey that people said their accents, 21% of people said that they felt that their accents stopped them getting a promotion or would hinder them getting a promotion. I always get, oh my God, you don't sound like you're from Limerick. I get, I get the same, uh, you don't that's sound like you're from Bally Firm. That's why you got the job on the telly. the job on the telly. That's it, yeah, they were like, like can she do the not sounding <laughs> from Limerick? <laughs> right. Greg O'Shea will be joining us soon as well. Terry Prone, who was here with us earlier on, was saying the worst, she felt that the worst accent from Wicklow and we were going, Wicklow? Wicklow. I love, Wicklow. I love Wicklow. the Terry. I love that Terry doesn't care. She's she like, yeah, care. whatever. What about Wicklow? What about the RD, RD? I tell you, the RD. Hey, hi. How's it going there? Is this the RD? Is that the RD, RD? RD and RD. <laughs> Suzanne says, I'm from Wicklow and I totally agree with Terry. It's the worst accent in Ireland. It's as sing along as you get. So is it like, uh, well, how are you? No. <laughs> Think you've nailed it there, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Oh, no, um, no, go again, go again. How's it going, Bernard? <laughs> do you think everyone no, that isn't from... I don't know, do think, I don't know. Do you think <laughs> everyone who isn't from Dublin is from Cork? Is that what is it that is? Is that Cork? Is it Cork pie? Cork, All right, Cork, there you go. I mean, whenever I went and uh, played in the Ospreys over Wales for four years, I used to get abuse every day for my accent. For your so, Monaghan accent? Yeah, for so 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 many people, I'd say, who are living and working but in the UK But you don't have a thick else. Monaghan accent. No, but it's the Irish accent. It's the Irish, oh, the accent. Irish accent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, obviously, Monaghan and... Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. the Welsh is so much know. better. Catherine Zeta-Jones, can you give the, us one more RD? She is a bit of the RD. Can you give us one more? The RD, RD. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The Aldi, Tell us. Do you like your accent? Accent where you're from? Do you think it's the worst accent? Where do you think has the worst accent? Or the best accent? Or the best accent yeah, in Ireland? Yeah, you know, Gavin. Gavin. An hour from Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now coming up next, we're going to ask him about his action. He's the reformed <laughs> British gangster. Actually, maybe we won't. Who is said to have a movie made about his life? We're going to be chatting to Stephen Gillen after the break. <laughs> Now, Stephen Gillen was one of Britain's most notorious gangsters, but turned his life around upon his release from prison back in 2003. He's now a best-selling author who's discussed everything from his life and an entrepreneur, and he's recently been working behind the scenes on the programme Gangs of London. It's such a good show. The violence is it's it's violent. crazy. I think we've got a sneak peek of series two that, that we can show at this hour of the day. No, we're fine. We'll hit them harder than they've ever been hit. Oh, you stupid. If you want them gone, you have to take what they control. Street by street, 
gang by gang, tower by tower. You have to destroy them from the ground up. You need a returning king. He does so little in that and it is so powerful. Stephen Gillen uh, joins us live from London. Now, good morning, Stephen. How are you? Hi, hi, Marin. Hi. Hi, Tommy. It's lovely to have you here. When you got the call from the producers of Gangs of London, because they brought you in as, as a consultant, what are you doing on the show? I, I was the face of the marketing. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people with inspiration for this, Marin. Obviously, it's... Um, it's a realistic series. It really is. It's a very brave series as well. You know that that you know that shows people a lot more about the upper echelons of 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 organised crime, especially in the city of London. It's extremely violent. I mean, ex like I nearly had to turn it off at one stage because it just it was so bad. But what sort of stories are there? Stories because as a consultant. You know, it's kind of based on bits of your life. Mm -hmm. So are there many stories that you have actually experienced that have actually been put into the show? I can say um, a lot of, a lot of characters on there. It's very well uh, drawn the script, you know, and the character development, immensely so. And, um, you know, of course, the fact and fiction, you know, is the thing to use, you know. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of characters on there that uh, resemble... Uh, Certainly a lot of people I used to know. And Stephen, is the violence, is it heightened for, for entertainment purposes or is is it real? Let's be honest, Mirren, uh, organised crime and it's it's aftermath and what it does, it's a, it's a terrible business. It's very violent, you know, it really, it really is less and more than what we see on Gangs of London. The entertainment is there, of course, to drive the narrative and it's a, it's an extremely violent um, depiction. But, you know, let's be honest, uh, violence is violence. There's certainly a lot of um, terrible violence in organised crime. I mean, people probably tuning in now and looking at you, Stephen, wouldn't be thinking no. that you were involved in, in, a, in a high level of violence and crime at different levels. But you actually, you grew up in Belfast, kind of at the height of the troubles as well. Was it a difficult time to grow up in Belfast or is it something that you look back on with fond memories? I look back with fond memories because it's my history. It's me, you know. I, you know, I always have that place in my heart back home. All my family was Irish, um, you know. Of course, it's part of me. Um, I stayed there till I was nine. Of course, I was right in the middle of it all. When I come to East London, for instance, um, it was a fast place, but it was nothing like Belfast. It was calm by comparison. And when did your life of crime? Begin. As you mentioned, you moved to London when you were nine years old. Like, are we talking in your teenage years or what happened, Stephen? I kind of, when I look back, Mirren, I, you know, I would say that it started when I come to London, really. You know, I was the child on the boat, you know, uh, with nothing that, that was sent to a place it didn't know where he was going. So, you know, I had to, I had to circumvent a lot of stuff. I had to survive and, you know, that forged me. I had a lot of the further traumas that, made me really open to be groomed and susceptible to the life I stepped into. Do you think that that's a problem? I mean, because you are known as very much a hard man who, you know, had to be the, the person who laid down the law, I suppose. I mean, do you look back on that? Uh, do you kind of, do you look back on that? Are you scared to even think of that? Have you kind of tried to delete those memories um, from, from your brain now? Transformation is is a is a is an ongoing process, Tommy. You know, it really is. I've had to do so much work, and uh, I'm the real thing. You know, a complete 360 metamorphosis, and uh, I'm very privileged, you know, to have the chances I do now. But as human beings, we we carry stuff. You know, we are accountable for our actions, you know, and our choices, and um, you know, we carry stuff, and um, so it's an ongoing process. Because that's the thing, of course, you have hurt people in life and there are victims now who are, who are in the world and obviously think of you a certain way. But you did, uh, you got a 17-year sentence in 1991. You went to prison. You served with people like Charles Bronson. You know, it, it was hard time. Uh, and, and you've come through that. What was prison like? Like, is, 
did it do what it was meant to do and go, OK, I can't be involved in this life anymore. I need to turn it around. Mirren, it was desperate. It really was. You know, I was a Category A inmate. I was released to Category A inmate. There's, you know, immense violence in there. I see a couple of people murdered in there. Everything is security. You know, it was, you know, the deepest, darkest hole of the place, really. I never thought I would get out of there, you know. So if you think about hell on earth, really, every day for 11 years and nine months, it really was a desperate place. So how did you turn it around, Stephen? What was the catalyst to think, you know what, this is has been my life up until this stage. I'm doing hard time, but you know what? I'm going to turn my back on it. And is it even is it even easy to turn your back on it? Given that I'm sure there was a a number on your back almost as well. When you're when you're in that life, it's extremely difficult to get out of it. But one of the things with me, Tommy, is in that life, I always played by the rules. I never got anything that's that's apparent to see. So you know, I seen through the life for a long time, you know, and I'd want it out. You know, when you have friends who you've known for 25 years who are going to set you up to get you killed, then, of course, you know, you're going to look at the life that you're, that you're living because there comes a point, even if they're trying to protect you, that it goes beyond them in this life. So, you know, I wanted out of that life for a long time and I, I it, you know, I took the opportunity, thankfully, you know, to get out of it. I couldn't hurt people anymore and I'd seen through that life. And that is the point of prison. It is rehabilitation. Um, me, yeah. It's meant to be serve your time and, and try to get a new life. You have thankfully done that. Loads of people haven't. Do you think that, you know, modern day justice and prison sentences are, are doing what they're meant to do or do we need more supports? Do we need to get there at an earlier age to stop people getting into a life? Are we doing enough to stop that life for young people? We're currently developing the Stephen Gillard Foundation, you know, which looks at the roots, you know, of a lot of this stuff. It's certainly about instruction. It's certainly about opportunity. It's certainly about the right role models. It's certainly about the family foundational stuff, you know, to get the messaging in, you know, the right messaging. You really do have to focus on the good stuff to let the good stuff in, Mirren. You know that. One of the things is... Uh, environment and so forth can translate, you know, the family unit can translate destructively to people. That's not a good start, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, and just two years ago, you released your autobiography, an absolute bestseller, The, the Monkey Puzzle Tree. I gather it's now being turned into a, a, a movie. How involved in that are you and how excited are you to hopefully bring that to the big screen? It's 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 immense work. It has been over these years, you know, an unbelievable learning, you know, and you know, it comes to the stage that they're talking about you in the third person like a plant or something. It's a really strange experience. But I've been, you know, I've been in the middle of that. I'm a CEO of a of a media company. We make TV and film. I know the industry, which has really helped to uh, navigate navigate. Um, getting it to the silver screen in the right way. So uh, I've been very lucky there too. Uh, well, every time I see Colomini on the screen in Gangs of London, I'll be thinking of you. I think he's, <laughs> I think he's, got, a, he's, he's got a few of your characteristics on that. Uh, Stephen Gillen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, it's Gangs of London series two available on Sky Atlantic as well. I it's too. I, I love the it. Sound it's a really good storyline though. The storyline, I, I love all that. Yeah, I know, brilliant. but when they're crushing bone, they're uh, crushing bone. Okay, still to come with lots more Ireland. Um, hopefully, you're going to be in the kitchen for a bit of food for the old Tommy Rumble, and that's coming up next. Oh, I see. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Becco Harvest Fresh. Sponsors Cookery on Ireland AM. Now we're feeling ha, ha, ha. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Paul Knapp, the firefighting chef, is making griddle hotcakes. Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How this are we? This is unusual for you. Uh, no, I'm not really a baker. It's not really my thing. There's too many rules in baking. You have to follow like, recipes and it has to be weighed and stuff. You can't just chuck it in. So, yeah, well, you've my comfort zone. nailed it. Well, so I'm tasting it yet. Yeah. <laughs> go off you go. Knock yourself out. <laughs> you look amazing. So, what That's they are, uh, Yes, please. There's a, there you go. Uh, all of that is dairy free. There's no butter. Oh, look at this. And that's plant based grass. Look at that. Oh, look at this. Let's just spend the next hour. We've got six minutes of watching Tommy. Yeah, tell us.
us. What have we got okay. here? Okay. Right. So basically, what we got is we've got griddle hotcakes, and we're serving those with baked plums. So we're starting to introduce some kind of like seasonal flavours. Okay. All of the recipes up on Island M's Facebook page, as well as Virgin Media One's website. So what we got first of all is I just introduced you to these baked plums. They're really, really simple to do. So they act like a fruit compote, like kind of like a cheap jam, something like that. All right. So all I took is 600 grams of plums, and all I did is I cut them in half, north to south, twisted them open, and took out the stones. I got an orange and I just zested the orange onto it and then oh, I juiced the orange. Is, yeah, so I zested the orange. I juiced the orange as well. Look at that. Juiced the orange as well. And then what I put in there is a little bit of vanilla bean paste and I just put in there some cinnamon. And all we do then is we literally just cover that with some tin foil and we bake those in the oven. So these are really, really simple. They take about 15 to 20 minutes to do. Okay, and we want them just so they just kind of just start to just to lose sort of temperature. You think it's about 180 gas mark four well, yeah. for about 15 minutes. Take that off after 15 minutes and have a quick check. Okay, mm. so they just we bang those in there like that, and then we can forget about them, and so then we move good. on to this. All right, brilliant. so lovely. So 150 grams of self-raising flour goes into our bowl, and into that as well we pop in uh, a little pinch of salt. I've got uh, 50 grams of caster sugar goes in there. And then I put 70 grams of currants goes in there as well, okay? Wow. If you can't get currants, you can put in sultanas, you can put in whatever you want, all right? And then I've got in a quarter of a teaspoon of mixed spice. So mixed spice is kind of made up of uh, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg. It's all those kind of seasonal spices, like I put into the plums as well with the mm -hmm. cinnamon. And all we do is we just quickly give our little dry ingredients a mix together just to incorporate everything there. And then all I'm going to add into here is it's 70 grams of a plant-based butter, all right? So it's it's kind of like years ago, people used to use a margarine and stuff like that, but this yeah. is just a plant-based butter. And all we're doing, we're just rubbing this together. What do you mean a plant-based butter? So it's dairy-free. It's got it's, it's marketed like in a butter pack. It's called plant-based butter. Oh. It tastes quite like butter. You know, like margarines used to before taste. They didn't kinda, taste. I like, don't believe it's not butter. But it isn't butter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. So all it is is just plant-based butter. And all we're doing is we're just rubbing this in like you would do, kind of if you make like a pastry and stuff like that. So this is basically what it is. Very sort of reminiscent of a scone mixture, you know, with your currants, yeah. with your cinnamon, uh, with your cinnamon, with your sultanas and things like that. So we rub this in, and one of the things I suppose the key things to remember when you're making the likes of scones and stuff. Like I'm not a baking expert, so I have to Google all this stuff. Do you know what I mean? But like the likes of Catherine will tell you. But when you're making the likes of these in comparison to bread doughs, the less you handle it, the better. So once you bring it together into that dough form, you don't want to start kind of like kneading it too much because it doesn't need a lot of kneading because it will go tough. Yeah. Whereas the likes of bread doughs, you need to really kind of massage these. We make these at home. Do you? Mm. And you know, you've got a... They're called Welsh cakes. Welsh cakes, yeah. because Lucy's from Wales and she... Would, and would she that be a family them. recipe yeah, type thing? Well, not family well, recipe. But well, but they, they used to make... They'd make them. When we go back home, uh, her mum would have them or we'd go and you'd always get them in the cafe and stuff. So and all the I'm, kids love them. They do. They're, they're really... And, sorry, and you can make these and the next day you can pop into, into lunches. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is put in about... Probably about a tablespoon, maybe one and a half tablespoons of, again, a plant-based milk of choice. And all we're going to do is we just bring this together. All right, and it just comes together in a dough. All right, so it just literally just forms into... Just keep adding until you have enough. Um, the other thing with baking as well, it's really, really messy. And I just like, you know... How many would you get out of that? This will yield eight. eight. You, yeah, so if you, if you think... If you know, like, a digestive biscuit, Mm -hmm. So if you make it twice as thick as, as a digestive, if you kind of go on that, like if I said like five or eight mil, people say how thick. So you don't want like the big, no, it's not. No, because thing. we're cooking this in the pan, OK? So if oh, you cook yeah. that, it wouldn't cook. So all we do, we bring this together, OK? Onto a lightly floured surface, we just bring out some of this and we pop our dough onto here. What I really like about it, Paul, is the cinnamon. Yeah. You can really taste that. You get it's that gorgeous. in the plums. The cinnamon yeah. comes out in the plums. So all we need to do, you don't need a rolling pan even, really. We can just pat this out into our kind of pan shape as we said there, probably about two digestive biscuits high. And then with a pastry cutter or the top of a mug of a cup or something like that, if you don't have a pastry cutter, all we're going to do is just going to bang these out. Mm. OK. And then with the leftover dough, we just bring that back together again. All That's right. And yeah. keep cutting them. And like keep cutting. And all we do so is it just goes into the pan. Just into the pan. All there was is a little tiny bit of oil on there. And if you cook with a skillet, you'll know about, like, seasoning it to make sure that it's well-seasoned and stuff like that. And will they not brown outside too much before they cook inside? That's why it's on a very low heat. With the likes of a skillet, it transfers the heat quite evenly and quite well, OK? Whereas if you... You can cook these in, like, a non-stick pan, but what will happen is that you have to be really, really careful because the heat transfers so quickly on a non-stick pan. As you see there. Look at that. Mm. OK? So these ones are fresh. Nice. Yeah, because when I make them, I have it on too hot and it burns. And then it burns, yeah. Mm. And then inside it's not done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So our plums... And this one. 
So as you said there, I don't know if you can just see the plums there. Oh, look at that. So you've got a lot of liquid there. You can smell the orange juice. There's maple syrup in there. There's cinnamon in there. There's the orange there. So we're starting to get into it with all those, I said there, all those seasonal flavours. So all we do then to construct this, we take our wonderful spatula, OK? We just take one of those, like so. We get a spoon, like so. If you wish, you can put a little bit of butter on it. You take one of these little things there, plop that on the top. A little bit of the juice goes over the top of that. And if you want to be greedy and you want to sit yourself on another one, whoop, Why not? Whoop, pop that up. one on there, get rid of that. Huh. A little bit of icy sugar goes on top of that. Job Hold done, that. happy days. And these are, and then you have them here gorgeous. as well. Yes. They're absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So you can eat them as they are like that, or you can put them together like that with a bit of cream, a bit of butter, whatever you want. The but plums. even to make them and just put a little bit of butter on them. Absolutely. Yeah. And leave them cool down and so you can just bring them into work with whatever it is. And it's just, yeah. it's just like a scone. Pop it in the microwave, warm it up, whatever you want to do. Super. Super. Delish. Oh, Matt, thank you very much. Thank As you always, very you're much. Welcome, Cheers. Oh, absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Now, after the break, he was once a social media tycoon who is now saving dogs in Thailand. We're hearing from Niall Harbison's story next. We'll see you in a few minutes. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Welcome back. Now, our next guest was once a country controversy courting entrepreneur. We loved it. And after selling one of Ireland's best-known media brands, he now lives in Thailand rescuing dogs, no less. Niall Harbison, welcome to Ireland AM uh, from Koh Samui this morning. Good to have you with us. Um, let's take it back, Niall, to when you started Love in Dublin. Of course, a huge brand. Everybody would have come across it. Were you a chef initially? And or how did you get into the whole tech world? I used to be a chef. I actually cooked a few times on uh, on your show, believe it or not, probably back in like 2008 or 2009. And then I kind of transferred over to media. Chefing's a pretty hard job, uh, I figured out. So I wanted less of the long hours. Uh, and then, yeah, I went into to online marketing and building media companies. I love the way I was like, I was doing a hard job. I wanted to do what you do, you skyvers. Exactly. So I, could do a bit I just of media. eat all the food. It's but great. you had, like, as you were chefing, you once worked like on private yachts for like the Microsoft co founder Paul Allen, like serving all these celebs, like Bono would come on the yacht and you'd do a full Irish. So it was sort of a rarefied life that you saw. It was. I got to travel a lot. And like, it, look, it's like everything. It sounds a lot more glamour, glamorous than it is. Like the, you're cooking for the celebs, but you're down below deck. So um, it, it, wonderful for traveling. And I got to see the whole world doing that. But it's kind of a, a younger person's uh, job. So decided to get out of the kitchen. So tell us more about Love in Dublin. Where did that start? Um, it was actually just a blog. I just wrote one day. Like, I liked going out to eat restaurants and I just wrote some reviews and I kind of just wrote them as they came out of my head, which uh, probably got me into trouble a little bit. But if something was not very good, I'd say it was not very good. And if something was amazing, I'd say it was amazing. And it just kind of grew from a blog into something much bigger. I think it was kind of around the time Instagram and all those things started. Like, believe it or not, that's like 2012. So it was just rode the wave of early social media and it grew into kind of a media brand then, yeah. Yeah, it was like kismet the timing that you came up across it. But you also, you tapped into something, I suppose, on social media, and that is being controversial gets you link clicks. It, get, it got you noticed very quickly. Like there's a very famous old blog post where you use derogatory language about inner city kids in Dublin. And like, was it genuinely, as you say, just it just was in your head and it came out? Or was there more of a game plan about what you were doing? Because it really did get the brand noticed. I wish I was smart enough to say it was like a game plan or like you look at people do it now and that's kind of the modus operandi if you know to, to do that but no it was just I kind of in my head I just thought I was being uh, like funny or something and the way I was writing it was just like I don't know it just it's kind of it's not very funny at all, but at the time I thought it was kind of just honest and truthful about what I was doing, but it got me into a fair amount of trouble. But no, I'd love to say it was intentional and it was like some sort of master plan, but definitely not, because I got an awful lot of abuse for it, which wasn't very nice and like death threats and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it definitely wasn't intentional. Uh, we see your, your buddy sitting beside you there. I'll chat to you about him in just a second. I have to ask you, though, because you made... It was no secret about your addiction with the likes of alcohol and how you did go through a difficult time with that. Was moving to Thailand a way to get away from that, the scene that you're in in Dublin, or 
So what was the catalyst to move all the way over to Thailand? 100%. Like this time, this very time of the year now in Ireland, like I've, I've no shame admitting it now, like I was definitely an alcoholic and suffered from depression and um, really struggled with this time of year, especially the nights, you know, when it gets dark at half four or five o'clock, Christmas party season is just around the corner. I just loved the pints of Guinness at five o'clock and then ended up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning coming home when most people would go home normally. And that sounds like fun and a bit of a laugh or whatever, but you know, then I'd still be drinking on a Monday morning, having a bottle of wine at uh, nine, probably the time your show's on, I'd be having a bottle of wine and easing myself into the day and taking Valium and stuff like that to calm myself down. So yeah, I moved here for, believe it or not, like Thailand, probably in your head, you think party scenes, all that sort of stuff, but actually there's really healthy living buzz here as well. So that was a, primarily the weather and the kind of healthy living scene was why I moved here. I think, Niall, you know, reading about your sort of moment of realisation when it comes to alcohol, because you weren't able, you didn't just initially just give it up when you went to Thailand. You did have a moment that, that changed everything. Yeah. I, a moment is one way of putting it. Like, yeah, I, I think I nearly drank myself to death, to be honest. Um, s slowly, well, like slowly over a few months, <laughs> like I was drinking, I'm not joking here, I was drinking about three or four bottles of wine a day, uh, two Valiums, and then I'd have 10 pints. And I'd maybe sleep in the middle of that and wake back up and have them. And it ended up just horrific, um, where I finished up on whiskey, which I never drank in my life. But it's the only thing I could drink in the morning was like half a bottle of whiskey to calm myself down before I could like go to the shops to get more alcohol or go to the chemists to get Valium or like whatever the next step was. So I ended up in hospital. Yeah. And like I was rigged up to machine. It was like ICU basically for three days. And that's when I decided to change everything. It was like the ultimate wake up call. Yeah. yeah the ultimate wake up call. Absolutely. And, and you've discovered a new purpose and, and it is pretty incredible. I mean, and we see, you see the dog walking around behind you, but, uh, how did rescuing dogs in Thailand, where did that come from? Well, I was always like, I, I always liked dogs, like a lot of people. And when I was in that hospital bed, I'm not joking you, like I was counting down the seconds. I was like, look, if I can stay alive for 30 seconds, then I might make it. If I can just make another minute, I'll, I'll still be alive. And then I, I lay there and I was like, right, if I'm going to die, I was like, what have I achieved in life? And I'm like, okay, I pushed some spreadsheets around and did some numbers and wrote some blog, but like nobody cares about that. Nobody's gonna remember you. It was a fairly meaningless existence. So I was like, what do you, what, how could you make a difference if you did survive this? If you somehow managed to get off that machine and, and live, what, what could you do? And I was like, I love dogs. I'll go and do that. Now, I didn't, it wasn't that coherent to think about it in two minutes, but like that evolved over the next month or two after I got out of hospital and I was like, right, I'm going to dedicate my whole life to dogs. I don't, I don't care about money. I don't care about, you know, fancy cars or prestige or anything like that. I was just like, I'll just dedicate my life to dogs because then next time I am dying, hopefully in 30 or 40 years from natural causes or something, uh, I can lie there and be like, I've I've done something really worthwhile in my life. So that's that's how this sort of chain of thought came along. It's really beautiful. And I know that people can follow you and people can get involved. You're trying to save, you know, feed 10,000 dogs um, a month. Where can people find you online, Niall? Uh, just Instagram or Twitter, really. Just my name is probably the best place. And you can, I, I try to put out happy content because I know, you know, like I love charities and dog charities and everybody does such amazing work. But I find it myself as an animal lover quite upsetting sometimes to see that stuff in my social yeah. media. Uh, yeah. And it puts me in a bad mood that there's so much cruelty. So I just try and put really positive spin on everything and give them a little character. It's like a soap opera for dogs, I, I kind of say. Oh, listen, fair play oh, to you, Niall. Um, you know, given that epiphany that you almost had and, and the dark times that you had as well and living it up over in Thailand, it can't be too bad over there, can it? Uh, Niall, thank you, Niall Harbour, thank you very much. And uh, cheers for talking to us. And sure, we'll get you onto the sofa when you come back to Dublin at some stage. Thanks, guys. Now he's never coming back. He's, he's having, not coming he's back, is he? Good. It's very honest what he said there about, his, about his life and uh, what he needed. And hopefully he might have helped someone this morning. Absolutely. And now let's see what's coming up in the final hour of Ireland AM. It's over to our Alan.
He's so far away. You're so far away. I'm over here. I'm <laughs> over here. Thanks, Marin. Yeah, still to come, we're going to be chatting to Barbara Windsor's widower, Scott Mitchell, about his new memoir, in which he opens up about Barbara's battle with Alzheimer's. Ireland M is back after this short break. Welcome back. There's lots more on the way. This is our final hour. It's Hello. Flown. Yes, it sure has, actually, hasn't it? Uh, Scott Mitchell, the former husband of late screen legend Barbara Windsor, has released a memoir. He'll be telling us why he was trolled after the EastEnders legend's death. Very sad. Yeah. Uh, also this morning, we have tasked our movie man, Brian Lloyd, with reviewing this year's I'm a Celeb. Now, he and I, we've never watched a series before, and Brian's like, uh, yeah, having a clue, don't know, so God only knows what he's going to make of it. I'm, going, I'm looking forward to this. I love a bit of I'm a Celeb. I think yeah. it's great, yeah. I think it's good fun. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to do it? You should probably be doing it instead of me, to be honest. You no, know what's actually going Brian on. should be perfect, exactly. Mike Tyndall, though. Mike You've got Tindall's an insight in with it. Mike Tyndall. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure who... Uh, Chris Moyles, the de DJ's there, Why obviously. Why is Mike Tyndall doing it? Because um, it's a bit of fun, isn't it? Why not? Would you not do it? No. If you were to do any of those, you just want to do Countdown, don't you? Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, Alan, uh, what sort of winter wear have we got? Would you do any of those? Uh, Dancing I'd... or jungle? You have been asked, but oh, always. No, there you go. Of course. Uh, <laughs> stylist Lorna Duffy is with us, and we've lots on offer from um, office uh, to power suits to cozy knitwear. Yes. Got it. Everything this morning, Alan. So, as you can see on Kerry, this beautiful power suit, we've got a fantastic print midi look coming up, those oversized coats, knits. Bit of everything. Day to night, work wear, weekend wear. Yeah, you've you done name your it. stylist bit with uh, that belt, haven't yes. you? Yes. I, I can put it on and wrap it at the back. I the could, oversized yeah. Oversized belt, the flare <laughs> pants. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely okay. stunning. So lots Some uh, great fashion coming up a little later on. Welcome oh. back. Now, earlier on, we were talking about a story to do with accents that a sixth of people think that they have been discriminated in the workplace because of their accent. <laughs> Which I would imagine a lot of people are. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And I felt that they couldn't get a promotion because of their accent and stuff. And we were getting some great texts in all morning. Because and Terry Prone said that the worst w accent in Ireland is Wicklow. Wicklow. Terry Prone said that, not us, not us. And Sonia said, I get a lot of stick from my own family about my accent. I'm from Ballyferm, so am I. And I'm not yeah, common enough, it seems. One time I answered my dad's phone and the person kept hanging up. My dad answered on the third attempt and it was my uncle. My dad said, why did you keep hanging up? And he says, I thought I was on the wrong number. Who's that posh person? <laughs> <laughs> Bally Firma. <laughs> Bally Firma. Um, You're too posh for Bally Firma. Do you know you always do that when you say Bally Firma? I say you Bally go, Firma. You always go real dumb. You, go, you bring it back. You bring it back to Bally I bring it back to Bally Yeah, you do. You picked up the phone. You can take the lad out of Bally But you can't take Bally out of the lad. Hey, Joe has said that, uh, wherever I got him, I have what would be considered as a thick Dublin accent growing up. I always felt judged by it. Um, from university to employment, I still suffer from imposter syndrome. I think that the north inner city Dublin accent is one of the nicest accents around. I yeah, absolutely is, yeah. adore it. Suzanne, I'm from Wicklow and I totally agree Wicklow. with Terry. It's the worst accent in Ireland, I says don't... Suzanne. See, none of us could get that the Wicklow accent was bad. I was trying to Google like all the different accents yeah. and Wicklow wasn't even one of them. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, oh, Jane said the nicest accent is Donegal. A nice yeah, Donegal like lilt. A Donegal oh, lilt. Yeah. To listen to Daniel O'Donnell all day yeah. long. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you could. And the, the worst is the Cork. Worst is oh, Cork. they won't be happy down in Cork now, boy. <laughs> <They will not. laughs> Every accent. We could ask him to do a Jamaican accent and it would come out yeah, Cork. Yeah, sort of comes Give out us, like that. Do Give an us. American <laughs> accent there. All right, boy. All right, boy. Give us your Wicklow one again. That would just... No, I can't do the Wicklow. I've no idea what a Wicklow... It's like slow. It's like slow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if we can actually get someone from... Someone from Wicklow, phone us in from and we Wicklow. record you. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be that bad. Oh, that? I don't know. It's like so Phone anyway. us in. If you have a really thick Wicklow accent, phone us in and we'll... we'll, we'll um... It's not the worst accent. No, it's not. No do, do, a, do a voicemail on our WhatsApp number. Yeah, yeah. okay. There you, uh, there you go. <laughs> we'll have a turn our I'm a celeb chat. Please, please, oh, please help us with Alan's Wicklow accent. We need to sort it out. Now, uh, thank you for all of the messages. Yeah, keep morning. them coming in. Now, after the break, I'm really looking forward to this. We all loved Barbara Windsor, and the late Barbara Windsor's husband, Scott Mitchell, joins us to chat about his memoir, which details their final years together. Stay with us for that. Thanks for staying with us. Now, everybody loved Barbara Windsor. She was a legend of the small and the big screen, giving us iconic performances 
from the Carry On films and, of course, playing Peggy Mitchell in EastEnders. I remember her voice as the dormouse in Alice in Wonderland as oh. well. She was so, oh, she was amazing in that. Barbara passed away in 2020 with Alzheimer's uh, disease. Now her husband, Scott Mitchell, is remembering her in a new book. Scott, welcome to Ireland AM. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing really well. Good morning to both of you. It's like lovely to be with you this morning. It's lovely to have you because we were talking about the book and, and it's a lovely way for you to remember the good times. We know that the end, obviously, there would have been hard times as well. There's gorgeous pictures. But can you bring us back 27 years ago to how you met Barbara Windsor and you became involved? I mean, it was one of those stories that shouldn't have happened. Barbara and my mum actually went to dancing school together when they were 11 years of age. Uh, they went to a, a dance school called Madame Behenna's Juvenile Jollities, which in itself is, you, you know, the, the name just takes us forward to a wonderful story. And then she actually knew my dad independently when she was around 18. She used to bump into him at the dance halls. Mum and dad got together. They stayed in touch over the years uh, through mutual friends. And I been to drama school I'd been out about a year and I went down to Hove in in Sussex where my parents were living where I came from and they said oh by the way why don't you stay down because our old friend Barbara Windsor is coming over for dinner tomorrow so I said I said look I said I'm sure she's really nice and everything I said but I'm not sure whether I want to have dinner with you two and Barbara Windsor I've got things to do I, you know I need to get back to London and, you know, they kind of said, well, Scott, come on, you know, she's so knowledgeable. She'll be really interesting for you to talk to. And I thought, yeah, actually, I don't know why I said that. And lo and behold, I, I stayed down and I went to collect Barbara. She was staying at the most wonderful actor called Victor Spinetti. She was staying at his house in Brighton. And she opened the door and I said, I said, hi, Barbara, I'm Scott. And she went, oh, hi. She went, uh, um, you'll have to come in. I'm not ready yet. And the funny thing was, you know, she had her, her coat, her gloves, her bag on. I thought, well, I don't know what's not ready. So she told me afterwards that she asked me in because she wanted to get a better look at me. She didn't know how old I was. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. On, I mean, and I, I'm holding the book here and it's so, it, when you look, even looking through the pictures, but is it true that Barbara told you that I, when she was gone that she, she wanted you to write this book? Absolutely. And uh, Barbara had said this to me on quite a few occasions and, and also before she had her dementia. And she, it came because I once said to Barbara, I said, Bar, I said, please tell me, why did you feel that you always have to be so honest when you do interviews and, and in your books? And she said, I'll tell you why, Scott. She said, because I'm the one who has to look in the mirror. I'm the one who has to own myself. She said, some people are going to lie at me, some people won't but I can always walk down the street and hold my head up high if I'm true to myself. She said, and one day, love, when I'm gone, they'll ask you to do a book. She said, and I want you to do it. She said, but promise me one thing, you will be honest. And at first I went, oh, bar. she went, Scott, please just be honest. It's important for you to go forward and it's important you tell our story. Don't leave it to someone else. And you wow. certainly have been honest in this, you know, your struggles with alcohol, it's its all in there. But also, you, in in classic reverse sexism, just like, you know, uh, Joan Collins and her husband, Percy, who've been together for years, you and Barbara, like the sexism ye faced because you were younger than her. And it was pointed out, and really from the mm. start, oh, these two were never going to last, these two were never going to last, and 27 years he spent together. Absolutely. I mean, there, there was a lot of comment. But the thing is, you know, Barbara and I, we were very real about it. We understood how we came across to other people. And of course, I was 26 years younger than Bar. I was this unknown actor who suddenly appeared in her life. It, she'd come to the end of her second marriage. So it was very easy for people to make assumptions. It's like they, they called me a gold digger. And as you'll read in the book, it turned out when I met Barbara, she had a huge debt from a bad business venture from her second marriage. She, she was a million pound in debt. So as far as a gold digger was concerned, I was a pretty useless one. <laughs> and Scott, literally, what was it like then? Because we're looking at some of the pictures here and I'm, I'm looking at some of the pictures like with Scylla Black and Dale Winton and Paul O'Grady and all these people. And of course, um, Biggins who was a huge, great, long-life friend of Barbara. What was it like for you then as a young actor, getting, going to all these parties and meeting these people? 
I mean, look, it was it was an incredible experience. I always I also found it quite overwhelming a lot of the time as well. Uh, you know, although I'd been to drama school, that I wasn't in that kind of level of, of success or anything like that to be meeting and mixing with these people. I mean, our first proper date was at the House of Commons. Uh, um, a, a, an MP's birthday party on the terrace of the House of Commons. So for me to suddenly be in this situation was, as I say, exciting, but but also quite intimidating and, and quite overwhelming in many ways for me. But I met some incredible, incredible people. Uh, Scott, I suppose you don't think about that. Well, you know, when you're in love with someone, you're in love with someone and you're not thinking about the end. But... I know that you kept it secret for a while. When did you notice that that there was that Barbara's memory was sort of going? Was there indications and signs? Yeah, it was most likely around two thousand and nine, um, where she said to me a couple of times that she blanked on the set, she'd frozen, couldn't remember her lines, which was so unusual for Barbara. She was so sharp. She she really, really was, and her memory was incredible. People used to phone her to ask her things. Um, and I said to her, well, maybe, you know, EastEnders, as much as you love it, the hours are really long now at this time of your life. Maybe you should have a little break, which she she did leave the show in 2010. Over the next couple of years, I started to notice more things that weren't quite right. Took her to see a neurologist in 2012. And unfortunately, 2014 was when he gave us the, the very sad news that it was Alzheimer's. I'm, and I mean, so sad when you think of it, because of this, this character, this woman, this beautiful woman that everyone loved and so loved life, and then to, to end up with that horrible disease. And, like, there was a time when she didn't even recognise you. That must have been heartbreaking. I, I think for anyone who has a loved one with dementia, from the, from the, from the word go, when you do get the diagnosis, I think the most human reaction is we all dread thinking ahead to that time when they may not recognize us and i have to say although it didn't happen obviously for a few years it was just as painful as i thought it was going to be there's no there's nothing that can prepare you for someone who you know so well that you spend every day of your life with for however many years suddenly looking at you a little bit like you're a stranger and no recognition and just saying to you I, i'm sorry but how do i know you um, it, it is heartbreaking and you never get used to it, but you learn to deal with it. I, I think my heart goes out to everyone who, who has a relative living with dementia, a partner, whether it be a parent. It, it's just a very cruel disease to go through. And, and also you have to learn as you go along because most of us are not qualified to be carers. And especially with dementia, it's ever-changing. So you're constantly thrown new challenges that you, you have to adapt to very quickly for them. Well, it's been so lovely you letting us inside to your life mm. with Barbara Windsor and, you know, everything that you went through, the good and the bad, the gorgeous pictures. Uh, it's a lovely book, Scott, by your side, My Life Loving Barbara Windsor. Uh, it's out now. Thank you so much for talking to us this morning, Scott. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks Thank so you. much. Cheers. Pictures are gorgeous, aren't they? They are just amazing. Like that. you story. could imagine the parties, the get-togethers. You can hear the... her laughing. Oh, head you can now, hear her laughing you? all the time. Yeah. yeah, just that yeah. laugh. Just and when I'd met her, as I said, we'd... I'd met her twice, and she was just amazing. Great crack. Yeah, was she? Great fun. Just got it. Great fun. Wonderful woman. Now, lots more still to come in early, and we're going to see you after this short break. from power suits to chic party dresses. We have tomorrow. it all lined up, loving it. Uh, stylist Lorna Duffy is here to show us some budget-friendly styles to freshen up your winter wardrobe. Yes. Good morning Good to morning. you, Lorna. Um, shall we? style, I'm so excited. Yeah. yeah, should we bring up our first celeb look? Yes. So, now, Joey King. Joey I, who, King, who's she's Joey just King? What do you mean, who is... She's right, in the kissing it. booth, booth she's one, in, two and three. Like, That's hello. what she's in. The phone booth with <laughs> Colin Farrell. Not that one, the oh, other one. sorry. <laughs> the other one. You know when you one. hear kissing booth and you say foam boots? Is she doing it on purpose? Oh is God. that the kissing booth? So she's this in is there. She's ready for a kiss. Beautiful yeah. Joey King. So obviously here we're showcasing the power suit. 
Louis Vuitton, Kenza, we are seeing them ever at the minute, but also that pop of colour, those really, really vibrant, rich colours on Carrie. As you can see, we've got this fabulous burnt orange two-piece. So this is from On Trend, sold as a set. Mm -hmm. um, I just love it. So firstly, obviously the blazer, you can wear it two different ways. You can wear it with that oversized belt as one, yeah. or if you wanted, you could throw a little cami top under there. Throw away the belt, keep just like button it or leave it open as well. Yeah, so you've got two orange. little options. It's a nice little burnt orange. Burnt orange, good yeah. colour for the yeah, season. Yeah, definitely well. good. Kind of just from the autumn colours, then coming into winter. Really, really nice. And it's just a really nice sort of structured look as well. Um, and then we've got these beautiful flared trousers. And then of course we've teamed with this other little bag. Again, that sort of pouch style bags, very much in at the minute. But that again, it's lovely. Is it a very Yeah, it's really nice. Designer esque, it works. Uh, but you know, if so you could go for a nine to five enough. if you wanted, you could throw on a court heel uh, or, or you could drive it up as you can see we've gone for a little strap heel so all of our shoes this morning are from Murphy's uh, shoes in Bantry uh, love the little black straps they're just very very cute absolutely gorgeous but yeah I think just like as an overall look they're fantastic just super really, really that. I love the tie around the waist and stuff yeah, as well absolutely uh, what no, about jewelry really wise well. so our jewelry here this morning so this um, is from Little Details Ireland a uh, beautiful Irish business we've gone for subtle dainty, dainty accessories here a little bit of sparkle we've got these lovely sort of oval style ears and then we've gone for a gorgeous little necklace as well, that sort of clover. And um, we've got black at the front. You can actually flip it over to the side if you wanted to go for an all gold um, style necklace as well. Mm. Lovely for a little gift idea if you wanted. Um, and then uh, we've got a gorgeous little design inspired ring. Lovely. They're so nice. lovely. Yeah. Very 70s look. Very Harry, that's 70s. Absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely Thank you so much for that. Stunning. Going to move on to look number two. And our inspiration is Victoria Beckham this I morning. Love. She's always on my Pinterest board. I just, I just, I love to talk about Victoria Beckham. I love to talk about it. So here we are going for, firstly, the midi skirt, but also um, the sort of bigger, bolder prints. I like so, the pattern of the print. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so Chloe, nice. so a lot of, like, we've seen a lot of kind of designs, their autumn winter collections, very, very similar styles. Even Victoria Beckham's actually current collection, very, very similar style of skirts and prints and that kind of thing. So beautiful. Now this look here on Noma is just... on with Noma, yeah. You, I... I need this outfit, including the boots, which we will get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. However, we'll start off with our jacket. So this is just beautiful. Cream on cream, we've got that leather look. It is absolutely beautiful. It's not your typical leather jacket as well. No, it's like Naughty's Gucci. Spot on, right? Yeah, absolutely. Really nice. And you don't have the zip detailing. It's just a little bit dressier, so it's very, very nice. And then we have teamed it up with a light rib. Um, Lovely. Just throw yeah. it in because it is winter after all. Uh, again, love that shade. Uh, it's really your crisp. And you know, mm, if you wanted, you could go. Is nice. That's it. Yeah, really, really, really elegant. And there's just so many ways you could. Dress no it up, blending dress it with makeup involved. Put on a polo neck, your brand, your neck, and do whatever <laughs> it wants. Got it. Absolutely and then minimal the print, effort uh, this morning. Then as well. And then you have that the skirt. So this is available in a few different colours. But again, firstly, that pop of colour. Yeah. Just you know, it's nice to kind of add in with those neutrals. But again, just the prints. Um, absolutely stunning. And yeah, I just love it. The it's boots. Seventies nice, again. It's flowy. These boots. I need them, first oh, of all. Oh, no, you're too cute. Divine. I love that. They're, they're so, so cute. I love the colour, the style. <laughs> I love that they're knee-high. Lots of sizes available in them, but I really, really like the fact that they're not a high heel. No. So they're... they're almost like a block heel. They're so the go-go go sort of boots yeah, style. Yeah, go-go boots. Super comfortable. You're going to have lots of walking. You're not going to be walking around, hobbling all over the place in pain. Lovely, lovely... Um, heel there and they're just absolutely stunning. Lovely. Love and then the simple jewellery with everything, then, gold yes. jewellery. So uh, these earrings are adorable. Uh, we've got a gorgeous pair of heart-shaped hoops. It's not your standard circular. Heart-shaped hoops. Absolutely beautiful. Again, all about those dainty accessories. Um, and then we've also then gone with a very, very cute little ring. Um, this is sort of like a gold halo star ring and then a lovely little bracelet then um, to... Just Lovely, thank you so much for that, Noma. And we've got a new stand on the catwalk. I know. I love yeah, that. Showing off the like, boots. I feel like it's like her signature Flamingo. thing now. It kind of Fantastic. works. Fantastic. Um, signature Middleton. thing. Yes. So this look here, um, so firstly here, we are focusing on two things. We've got that Lurex style material, so the little bit of sparkle, because obviously we're coming into silly season. And secondly, that overall, that sort of shape and style of dress. I the think pleats, there's... the V-neck, the long sleeve. So we're going with kind of those two different things here with Kate Middleton. Look, the dress you have is nice. Oh, I know. Middleton's oh, dress. I know. Oh, Way I know. nicer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. I don't even need to say anything. <laughs> I can just sit here and be quiet. It speaks for itself. It is absolutely stunning. So this dress here is from the Style Market. It's just so elegant. So 
any kind of special occasion in the next couple of weeks, dare I say Christmas party in the next couple of weeks, any sort of outing, it's just beautiful. We've got the sort of um, almost a pleated detail on the sleeves to tie nice with the pleat detail um, at the end of the skirt. Elegant feminine V-neckline, just the combination of the colors, the little hint of sparkle. It's just beautiful, absolutely stunning. And this is even a couple of different colors as well. I don't think the camera's doing the sparkle it's not, justice. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's like you always need like, like a, a full on light beaming on it. It's absolutely stunning. Um, and the belt A few different well. colors available on that. And then we've gone with a little belt then, um, just to finish it off, really, really nice. Um, and this one is free size. A little bit of sparkle again, as you can see. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's absolutely stunning. Ah, I just, yeah. Shoes, strappy set. Oh, well, there's lovely rings there that, mm. that, uh, that Ursa is showing us. Yes, so we've got a beautiful little ring. So we've kind of gone for a layered look with our rings here. So um, these pieces are from an Irish brand called Don't, Don't Kill My Vibe, two Irish designers. Um, create the most amazing pieces so you can buy them online and also they will be in Arnott's from November 12th up until Christmas but yeah nice little bit of layered detailing going on there absolutely stunning now firstly the earrings again mm. I need these they are absolute showstoppers they are stunning they're brand new in they are new to their collection what I like about them is you can wear them two ways so you've got the sparkly bit as you can see or if you wanted to go for a simple gold too you simply open the clasp and take, take it off. the diamante out and you've got a nice simple pair Lovely. of gold hoops and then as you can see you've got a, a nice little simple pair of gold strap sandals just to tie in with our gold accessories on that kind yeah. of as well. Ursula. Very so nice Ursula. Very, Beautiful. very cute. Beautiful. Absolutely stunning on Ursula. Now our celeb here, Ashley Roberts, you like a bit of the Pussycat Pussy Dolls, dolls. don't you? Yes. Absolutely don't stunning. You? Pink on pink on pink. Pops of colour, more pink on pink on pink. So again, we're going for the sort of Prada, Valentino vibes. Again, those pops of colour, but also that oversized jacket. All those oversized okay. jackets are really in at the minute. So here we will start off with this fabulous little coat. So this is available in lots of different colours, a gorgeous deep green, a blue, but again, the pop of colour with the pink. I just think it's just Lovely. absolutely yeah. stunning. That oversized, again, you need a really nice cozy jacket for winter. It's an absolute wardrobe staple. Uh, this is available in lots of different sizes as well as lots of different colors. Fantastic price point. And then we're gonna move on to our knit. Obviously a knit, I you like can't, have enough, nice, can't yeah. have enough knits this time of year. Really, really like it. Um, just the overall shape and style with the print as well. It's quite lightweight. Obviously, one thing I hate is if you kind of layer up and you're trying to warm, you're over layering and you're absolutely melting. Mm. So I like that this is quite a lightweight. Um, then we've teamed up with a nice pair of leggings. So we have rib detail going on. Again, absolute wardrobe staple, um, no matter what the season, in my opinion. And then a nice little sock boot because you cannot go wrong yeah. with a nice little boot. They're so um, handy. Absolutely stunning. And Again, the heel is high, but it's not too high. It's comfortable, yeah. so it works. That bag is amazing. Uh, I actually yeah. think it's really versatile. That's a very, that very cute. A very good bike. Absolutely stunning. And then we've gone for some beautiful little, um, sort of again, dainty um, kind of gold accessories here. So lovely little gold cuff, which is priced at 24, and then mini hoops priced at 28. Again, all about layering those accessories up. Absolutely stunning. And then here we've gone for a sort of a chunky style. We've had our dainty accessories, now we're going for a chunky style um, heart bracelet and a gorgeous little heart ring then uh, just to finish off oh, that oh, little nice. winter look. So thank you, Gary. Lots Lauren, of winter must very much. Have. Very nice, yeah. So Getting us all next set for the winter season. Yeah, thank you so much. You. Now we're moving on. Yes, Alan. Uh, he's a celebrity. Get him out of here. He says that every morning. <laughs> That's right, Tommy. After the break, we're taking a look back at the first episode of this year's I'm a Celebrity. Get me out of here and seeing who might just be the early front runners for King or Queen of the Jungle. We'll see in a few minutes. Can't see a thing. We're being so subtle this morning, <laughs> don't you think? Now, it's time of that year again. I'm a celeb is back, and this year the celebs are back in the jungle for the first time in two years. I've never worn one of these before. This is mad. Get I used to do that all day. Here to give his thoughts on this year's contestants is first time viewer Brian Lloyd. He's here with us. But before we chat to him, let's take a look at last night's opening episode. Welcome to Australia! Yeah! Just go. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Do what? I can't do this. You've known everyone that's going on. Yeah, because I kind of watch telly and <laughs> kind of watch telly. <laughs> oh, OK, hang on. There's a lot of writing on the inside. OK. So the alphabet. Uh, oh. I'm ripping this boat open. 
VIP stands for very isolated people. Oh. And they are now marooned on an island overnight. Ah, yes. We're <laughs> back. I have to admit, I love it. Yeah, I mean... I love it. Now, I know you haven't seen it before. You, sure. you're not... I don't watch it. You don't watch it either. <laughs> I love it, so I'm the expert here. OK, yeah. let's go. <laughs> you take it. Take it, man. No, but, for you go. Some, but for someone coming in, like, what... Tell us about Lasso, because it's fascinating the characters are getting involved. It really in is, yeah, definitely. Like I will say that like you can very much tell that they are casting this to archetypes. Like, you know, Mike Tyndall and Sue Cleaver are very much the mom and dad of the group. Babatunde, you know, very much the comedian, I would say. Um you know, Oliver Warner, he's the child, because, I mean, he's thick as he three didn't. planks. Owen, Owen, Owen Warner. Owen Warner, sorry, Owen so Warner. So he's yeah. the guy from Hollyoaks. Hollyoaks, yeah, who plays Romeo Nightingale. What kind of name is Romeo Nightingale? <laughs> he didn't Seriously. know who Boy George was. Yeah. He didn't, he went to, hello, yeah, who are you? He's probably I about know. 20. Uh, but, like, Boy oh, come George, on, come like... on, he's an iconic star. He didn't know anybody coming in, and he turned to Boy George and he went, how do you know these people? And Boy George says, because I'm, I'm around, I watch TV, I know these yeah. people. I don't know, yeah. Like, I mean, but it's, yeah, I mean, like, it's... Boy George clearly is the most, obviously, the most well-known person. Mm. Matt Hancock hasn't gone in yet. He won't be until probably Friday. Friday, yeah. I'd say, probably when he'll be He's a Tory politician. Yeah. Yes, a Tory politician. Do you mm -hmm. not think that his constituents are going, so you're getting paid a pile of money to go off to Australia for a few yeah. weeks and oh, you're not he, doing yeah, any work? He probably won't get in again. They, they probably won't vote for him again, no. but this is the chance he's taking. This okay. is it, Boy yeah. George is reportedly paying the most ever on item sled. There's reported £800,000 star. Yeah, that's what they're saying, yeah. And the closest next to him was Noel Edmonds no, no, back in 2018. Yeah. He got something like 550,000. Um, Matt Hancock, apparently, according to The Times, is being paid 400,000 pounds to do this. Like, look, the reason why people go into these shows, it's either they want a payday, they are trying to rehabilitate their career in some way, shape or form, or they're going into it for exposure. In the case of Matt Hancock, I'd say it's probably all three because he was involved in a lot of scandals when he was health secretary. Yeah. He then had an extramarital affair. So, like, you know, he's got all the reasons to go in there. Boy George, I mean, he's clearly going in for a payday. Olivia Atwood, I mean, you know, people know her from Love Island. Yeah. She's definitely, like, an opera on the scene because like you know she did like a couple what was it she did celebs go dating celebs she's go dating she, like this that. is her job this like, is her job yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she exactly. just goes from one 100%. show to the next yeah. exactly so like and you can already tell like when she was going in there like she was cracking jokes about her veneers and the fact that you know reality tv stars are you know not that smart and i'm here to prove them right like you she's can... very self-aware exactly. she's funny Exactly, oh, and yeah. that helps. That's yeah. a big help. That's a I big like help. her. I would have thought Chris Moyles was only going in for a payday as well, but yeah. there's no reports on how much he's getting. No, not yet. And, like, to be honest, like, I mean, I would have thought, like, Radio X were paying him enough as it is, so I'd say he's probably going in there for the exposure because let's not forget, like, Radio X, I mean, that doesn't broadcast here. Chris Moyles, outside of media people, he's not that terribly well-known. Like, no. And on top of that as well is the fact that he, like, a lot of people on this show has had controversies. Like, he was... You know, he had a lot of controversies saying stuff uh, that was pretty homophobic, yeah. pretty transphobic and all the rest of it. So, like, he it is trying to, I guess, rehabilitate his image in some way, shape or form. But I don't necessarily know if he's going in there for the money. Yeah, okay. we, we have people like Charlene White, who's a loose woman presenter. Yeah, interesting choice, because, like, I mean, she has, like, some pretty strong journalist credentials, you know, that sort of way. Like, she was an ITV <laughs> news anchor yeah. and all the rest of it. Now, I'd say probably, I mean, she was brilliant in the challenge, by the way. The, yeah. Like, she was fantastic we'll in the challenge. We'll talk about that in a sec, about that yeah. later. But, like, I would say she probably went in there because, you know, she's doing loose women now. I'd say she's got a bit of a yen for doing reality yeah. TV. And it's not as... It's more fun than doing the news, like. And we've got... Uh, <laughs> Baba, it is. Baba it Tunde. Is, like. I love Baba Tunde on Celebrity Gogglebox. Yeah. He's with uh, Mo Gilligan. And I swear to God, the two the of them two just, just make yeah. me so laugh. happy. Yeah. He's a dote. He's what you want to... In the, in the late hours, when it's winter. Yeah, exactly. He's just joyful, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. And, like, not only that as well, like, it's the Bush Tucker Telegraph. The Bush, the Bush Tucker Telegraph. He was in there last night going, yeah, the VIPs. We'll explain what happened because the VIPs, the four VIPs were picked. Yeah. They, they went for a nice meal, but then they thought, oh, this is going to be grand. But then they went, this is Babatunde, and the others then facing the challenge. And here's the VIPs now. They thought they were going to be all grand, but they landed on an island, and they have to stay on this island overnight and do the first challenge. challenge. Yeah. And, like, so we don't even know thing. what it's going to be yet. But, like, yeah, they were basically deposited on this island. Had to sleep outdoors, you know, with beds and everything, like, really kind of grimy-looking beds and yeah. everything. Um, 
God this help him. This is George Michael, so Scarlett is, yeah, Douglas, uh, Olivia Atwood. Atwood, and who else was there? Chris, Chris Moyles. Moyles. Chris Moyles. Chris Moyles. So they're the very isolated persons. Yes. yes. They're yes. the ones now. They have to do the first turn. So they have to sleep on these like rough beds. Uh, no comfort at mm -hmm. all, and do the first challenge okay. to get mm. to get uh, stars for the for the uh, camp. Uh, from there, we are we know that Matt Hancock is coming in later on this week. Also, someone that I wouldn't have expected yeah. when it was announced that Sean Walsh, yeah. who I think is a fantastic comedian, but obviously everything that happened when he was on Strictly, yeah. and he kissed Katya and his girlfriend, yeah. Yeah. like it's it, he's going in to rehabilitate. That's it. Him, That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, it's like I mean, look, I haven't watched the previous series, so I can't really speak to it, but like it seems very clear this year that everyone is going in there with a specific reason okay. and Sean Walsh again is going in there to kind of rehabilitate Okay, himself. first night down, what do you think? It's grand. I mean, like, no, look. Well, no, in fairness, the first couple of episodes I've, are I've been always that. like that. Yeah. You're in being introduced to them and it's a bit, you're not getting into the nit and gritty yeah. of what it is. Definitely. Like, I was talking to Jen Gannon about this, like, because she did it last mm. year. She yeah. was giving me tips or whatever. But she was, like, yeah, I mean, it's like, take, like, day three, day four is when you kind of see yeah. everything. But, I mean, yeah, it's good crack. It's fun. I mean, obviously, like, it's been a successful show. It's This is whatever exactly. season it is. You can it's, see why yeah. it, where it makes its kind it's of... It's going uh, to be huge. Yeah. We're, we'll all be glued. Thank oh, yeah. you very much for Brian that. Lloyd, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Now, for a look at what's coming up on tomorrow's show, Tommy. <laughs> Who's going to win, Al? Quickly. Uh, oh, it's too early to tell. Go on. Way too early to tell. Okay. Way right. too early I'm to Tindall. tell. Mike, Mike Tindall. Tindall. Mike Tindall. Going for. Mike Tindall. And now the ball Diego Maradona used to score the hand of God goal against England at the 1986 World Cup is going to go up for auction next month. Wow, we're going to chat to the man behind the auction. Plus Tipperary hurler Podrick Maher will be here to talk about his memoir all on the line. Ireland M. It will be back tomorrow from 7 right here on Virgin Media 1. The ball. Yeah, we have see the it ball. tomorrow. No, we won't have it. <laughs> well, we might have it. See you later.